they saw, that is the Codex Elementarius saw, or at least pronounced their goal as being one of reducing or even eliminating these barriers by creating international food standards that were acceptable to everyone in these different countries. It's just where we take, and I say we, the health freedom activists, where we take exception to this is in the implementation of it. What's happened is somewhere along the way it was hijacked by interests that were antithetical to what we consider to be the true health interests of individuals, of the consumers. Well, hello everyone. It's uh, great to be before friendly faces. I'm used to unfriendly faces at Codex meetings, so it's nice to be here. And um, in any event, uh, you're here because you want to hear about Codex Alimentarius, but I'll talk about some other things as well. So if you'll bear with me, I want to start out with something a little bit different and tell you there's a little too much feedback and tell you that a cure for cancer actually exists. That's what happens when you have big ears. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. A cure for cancer exists right now that has been used um, since the early 90s. There's been a researcher named Dr. Yamamoto who's de been defeating cancer with no negative side effects, with just once weekly injections that are given of a nanogram of a substance called GCMAF. It's a glycoprotein, it's a macrophage activating factor, and it's injected with a diabetic grade needle once a week because it has a half-life of uh, six days. And you do this, depending upon the cancer, for 30 weeks to about 55, maybe even 60 weeks. There have been zero failures. Everyone's been cured, particularly breast cancer, colon cancer, and uh, I think prostate cancer as well. And it's relatively cheap, certainly compared to chemotherapy, compared to, um, compared to radiation, all the traditional conventional uh, means of trying to treat cancer. This is by far and away far less painless, far more effective, 100% effective, and, uh, and it's out there right now, not commercially, but at least in testing, it's out there. And again, it's called GC, and then capital M, capital A, capital F. And uh, there are some critics of it, though. If you go on the internet, you can look it up. There have been some articles in our magazine on the subject written by Bill Sardi and some others who have researched this topic. And it's not yet commercially available except in one small clinic in Tijuana uh, in Mexico. And thank you. Uh, in any event, it, it works because there is a, um, uh, it's a macrophage, the MAF stands for macrophage activating factor. And what the cancer cell does when it, the reason it's able to defeat your immune system, not your personally, but a person's immune system, is because it exudes an enzyme called nagalase, and the nagalase inactivates the macrophages of your immune system. Everyone has two immune systems. You have a, uh, the acquired immune system, which are acquired from vaccinations or illnesses you might have had as a child, and that's the antibodies that are created. And then you have a secondary immune system called the innate immune system, and that's the white blood cells, the macrophages, and the like that are your first responders. They go in and they attack the, they're the first ones on the site. But these cancer cells exude this enzyme that I mentioned to you, and they inactivate and, uh, the macrophages. So what this guy found, Dr. Yamamoto, he found by giving these once weekly injections, it's sort of like sending reinforcements to the army, and it overwhelms the nagalase, and hence the cancer cell, with uh, enough GCMAF, enough macrophages, that they then destroy the cancer and the person's cured. Now, admittedly, he has um, just done this study on small groups of individuals, and that's one of the criticisms of, of this doctor's work. But what he's done is he succeeded, and here's a photo of a macrophage actually destroying a cancer cell. But it does work, and he's not had a single failure. The conventional approach 
by contrast. And I'm not talking just about cancer here, but I'm talking about all things. And I'm talking about our experience, what we know in the United States. And you take these figures and probably cut them by about two-thirds or maybe half, and that's what you'll get, maybe two-thirds, and you'll get that in the UK. But from conventional doctors, conventional hospitals in the United States, you have roughly 800,000 deaths per year. And you have about 100,000 deaths per year from approved drugs. It's around 106,000, 108,000 per year, but it does vary. And even from so-called safe food in a first world country, you have 5,000 deaths a year. So you have all these deaths per year from regulated, government approved, government surveyed, all of these things that are meant to be safe in our food supply and our hospitals and by licensed doctors and yet you still have all these deaths every year. Now contrast that, if you would, and I know this is a little hard to see, in fact I don't expect you to even read those words, but you can see the general shape of this outline and I'll explain it to you. This was done in Canada and it's the risk of dying relative to being killed on a Boeing 747 flight. And uh, more about that later, but anyway, at the very top, you can see how far out, the higher up you go in this chart, the more risk there is. The lower you go in the chart, the less risk there is. And then there's obviously a wide range in between. The very topmost uh, factor is the, that's associated with medical injury in acute hospitals only. And right underneath that, the second line that goes out is smoking. And then underneath that are various other lines that are also fairly far out to the right and those are related to doctors and use of approved drugs. Well, when you get down to natural food products, natural therapies and therapeutic products, you're right here. So you can see low risk, very low case of injury. In fact, the lowest item is your risk of being hit by a meteorite and killed. So it's <laughs> just above that, and it's below getting killed by a bee sting. So that's the risk factor. Now, I want to explain this to you because I want you to keep that in mind, please, as we go through this whole thing about codex. I know it seemingly doesn't have anything to do with codex, but actually has a lot to do with codex. Natural products are far safer. And by the way, I don't sell natural products. Uh, the National Health Federation is an organization of consumers. We don't represent the food industry. Um, we represent little old ladies and men who send in their last checks from their Social Security to join us and, and, and help us in our efforts. But just using, again, the United States as an example, in a 25-year period of using supplements, there were maybe five to 10 deaths. It depends upon how you attribute it, because a lot of times these people are also taking drugs. And if you um, go to the coroner or whatever, the coroner has a bias against supplements, and they're more apt, if they can, to find a supplement uh, responsible for the death, such as in the ephedra cases, than the drugs that the person were taking, or the obese condition they were in, or whatever else their health product, uh, health problem was. The wildest possible claim I've seen for deaths in the last 25 years is 75, and you compare that again with the 800,000, the 100,000, even the 5,000 for food, and you see you're dealing with already exceedingly safe products. In fact, in the United States, about 60% of the population takes uh, nutrient suppl supplements of some form or another. And of these supplements, probably if you add them together annually, that's about 53 billion doses, 53 billion. And in the year 2005, there were no deaths from 53 billion doses. Again, far safer than drugs, hospitals, or um, uh, conventional therapies of any sort. Now, these are natural remedies that work. Again, the GCMAF for cancer. GCMAF also works evidently on, on treating AIDS. You have selenium, which is very deficient in British uh, soil, so any food grown in Britain will not have much selenium in it. So you need to either take it supplementally or eat Brazil nuts to get your selenium here. And that's very anti-carcinogenic, 200 micrograms a day very antiviral, natural vitamin D for cancers, viruses, bacteria, magnesium and omega-3s for depression, resveratrol, you know, the 
one, one of the major constituents of red wine, which is uh, for longevity and also very antiviral. It's also good for maintaining hair color, as is biotin. If you take 5,000 micrograms a day, it helps you keep your hair color, uh, believe it or not. That's how powerful it is for helping in that, in that respect. These are all, and this is just a sampling, by the way, and there are many of you in the audience who could tell me a lot about this, so I don't pretend to know all that there is, or e even if I could, I don't have enough time during this talk to go through all the things that could work for you. It's just to give you an idea and, um, and, to, and to let you see that there are alternatives. But then you are here, or you wouldn't uh, already think that. So maybe I'm preaching to the choir. The problem, of course, is that alternative therapies are suppressed. You, uh, you we were always in encountering uh, resistance in the United States for cancer. It's only cut, poison, and burn. If you try to do any other modality, you'd be put in prison. You probably heard the story of Daniel Hauser, the young man, young boy, actually, who had to flee the state of uh, Minnesota to avoid a court order ordering him to submit to chemotherapeutic treatment. And he and his mother fled the state for California, I think it was, and then later turned themselves in. But he was to be forced to be given th uh, chemotherapy when he knew it wasn't going to help him. In fact, one of the contraindications for chemotherapy is that it's carcinogenic. And a lot of the people who undergo chemotherapy, they do not um, necessarily die of the cancer, but they do die of the heart condition that's caused by the chemotherapy. And then you have, what you have with a lot of conventional stuff is they say, oh, we're winning the battle because people are living longer. Well, they aren't. If I had a couple of salt shakers, just imagine, had salt shakers. This is the conventional discovery of cancer, and then this is the date of death. Well, all they've done is they've moved this salt shaker to this level, and they say, oh, they've lived longer. Well, they haven't. They just discovered the cancer earlier. They didn't make a difference in this endpoint at all. They just discovered this much earlier so they can say, oh, they lived longer, so we're succeeding. They haven't. So it's a big lie. So what they do is the competition is banned through laws, and they use government's coercive power to do this. If we truly had a free market, and the one does not exist today, if we truly had a free market, then we could all compete on a, on a level playing field. But it's the age-old game of commerce, and what is that? When you can't defeat the competition in the marketplace, you go running crying to mommy. And who's mommy these days? It's the government. So you go to the government, you pay money to these legislators, members of parliament, members of Congress, um, you have pharma, uh, pharmaceutical company, the industries, spending $6 million a day on lobbyists in the United States, $6 million, just to lobby government, to lobby the Food and Drug Administration in this country, the Food Safety Agency, and you have uh, just the halls of parliament, the EU parliament, and the EU commission just fill, filled with these companies that want their co competition eliminated. They use it by actually capturing the, the government agencies. And this is, a, this is a pretty important point for opening your eyes to the extent they aren't already open to understanding the process because a lot of people are under this myth, uh, certainly outside this room, that these government agencies that regulate various parts of business, of industry, are, are doing it for us. But they aren't, and they never have. If they ever did, it was probably for about 30 seconds until they were captured by the industries they were meant to regulate. You know, in the United States, they had uh, uh, a regulatory body, still do, called the Interstate uh, Commerce Commission. That's meant to regu regulate the trucking industry. Well, the truckers, trucking industry took it over ages ago, so they operate it like a cartel. And it's the same way with anything else, because when you think about it, who has the most interest in these agencies? It's not you or I. You know, we have school, we have work, we have children, we have parents to take care of maybe. We have, uh, we want to go to movies, we want to go to conferences like this. We have a whole number of things. The agency part of our brain, or attention part of our brain, occupies just a small part. So, what is it? Not even 1%. But for a company that's going to be regulated, a pharmaceutical company, a trucking company, an airline, 
it's 100% because it affects their bottom line profit. So they will dedicate a large part of their resources to capturing this agency, and they may do it in connection with others. So this is a concept that was broached by others long ago, but it's a very important one, that these are captured agencies. So don't ever be mistaken and think they're fighting for you. They are not. Um, instead, truth number one is, if I may be so presumptuous, is government agencies do not work for you. They work for the commercial and financial interests they are supposedly set up to regulate. And if you think otherwise, you're just li living in a dreamland. They are a tool for eliminating competition, and they can only be persuaded through coordinated and intense effort on the part of us to put enough pressure on them to cause them to change. And we can't cause them to change forever, but we can at least ca cause them to change for instances. So if you put them under the light, then they will, uh, they will respond. But you just have to keep in mind that doesn't mean you can then go home and rest on your laurels. They're going to re be reconverted after a time. So you have to keep that effort up. And there, uh, so here we have Codex Alimentarius. This is the ultimate prize to capture, at least for the pharmaceutical companies. You have an international body that was created to harmonize and standardize, standardize food regulations, both internationally and domestically. Now, I've been going to a lot of these codex meetings and over the last eight or so years, but Ian Crane taught me something at one of my uh, speeches that I did with him last year, I think it was, when he said, oh, it's really just a template. And I thought about it because I never really thought about it that way before. He said, yeah, it's a template for other things that they plan to introduce throughout the world. And the more I thought about it, I thought, you know, Ian's right. It is a template. And, um, and that's what they're doing. They're trotting this out and they're testing it and they're harmonizing all these standards and then they'll use it as a guideline in and of itself to then do, do it in other areas and other fields. So here, why bother with all these various countries when the pharmaceutical companies can capture codex, have one big guideline, and then that'll be the rule. And how is it tying us in? It's tying us in because of these treaties. Now, in the case of the United States and Great Britain, um, we've signed treaties called the uh, Sanitarium Phytosanitary Agreement. It's called the SPS Agreement. There's a TBT Agreement, Technical Barriers to Trade. In the case of the United States, there's NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, so-called Free Trade Agreement. It's really managed trade, but they call it free trade. Uh, there's CAFTA, the Central American Free Trade Agreement. All of these mention codex in various ways. And so there's this interlocking web of, agree of agreements that have been signed by the United States, by Canada, by Great Britain, by many countries that tie you, us, all of us in to implementing the codex regulations, not only in international trade, but domestically. And especially in the case of Great Britain, where you're a member of the EU, you're really doubly tied in because you not only have to go by codex, but by the European Food Supplements Directive and all these other directives that are coming out of Brussels. So they're creating standards that will force, by nature, will force um, all of us, especially the Anglo-Saxon countries, to adapt to a Napoleonic mode of law. And we've discussed this uh, before in our organization but, and in some previous talks, but for those of you who aren't familiar, you know, there's the Na Napoleonic standard, which is everything that is not specifically allowed is, is forbidden. And then there's the, what I think is the more freedom-oriented British common law, which is everything that is not specifically prohibited is allowed. You know, it's the flip side of that. And of course, with Great Britain having spread through the world, its colonies adopted the British way of doing this. So in Canada, the United States, Australia, New Zealand, even India, you find this. Um, but now you're in conflict because now you have British common law having to be subsumed within the Napoleonic code system of the EU superstate, and this is creating some harsh conflict and some, uh, I, I would like to think, cognitive dissonance here in this country at least, where people are not, uh, people are not uh, very happy with the way things are going. In fact, I was just seeing in the paper this morning that the UK Independence Party is, is almost neck and neck, I guess, with Labour for the next election. I don't know if that's true. It sounds pretty 
incredible, but it does show some, some great discontent. Um, regardless of one's politics, it's an indicator of something. Uh, the Codex Alimentarius Commission it was created in 1963 uh, by the Food and Agriculture Organization and the World Health Organization, and it started off kind of slowly with a few committees. Now, by this date, there's some 27 committees that are, and I'll bore you a little bit with the details of the structure just so you can put it all in context. There's some 27 committees, and the committees that interest the NHF in particular are the committees that deal with food and nutrition and food labeling. There's some others with food additives and food contaminants that we also go to. Uh, but we have been attending these meetings for eight years now and have been a pretty vocal voice. These, these committees are hosted by a particular country. So in the case of the CCNFSDU, excuse me, but Codex Committee for Nutrition and Foods for Special Dietary Uses, the one that's concerned with establishing uh, food supplement guidelines and infant baby formulas and the like, that's hosted by Germany. So they provide the location, they provide the meeting room, which is somewhat similar to this size. And they uh, also uh, provide the chairman or chairwoman as the case may be. And the chairman and chairwoman, they will have a lot of um, power because they can decide which way the meeting goes. So say we're all the codex committee people here and uh, we want to make a decision, there's no real voting that goes on. The uh, chairman will look out on the room and see and hear the speakers and, and the like and decide whether there's consensus. If he or she thinks there's consensus, then he or she says it, it's adopted, the standard, and if there isn't, then they argue about it some more. There's no actual show of hands and voting like that. Sometimes at the commission level on a few things, but ge generally it's run by consensus. And then underneath these committees, they've given birth to these little subcommittees that they call working groups. They're either electronic working groups or they're physical working groups. And we can take part in these, and we often do, and we submit paperwork to argue our various positions. But all of these are working to one goal, and the goal is standards and guidelines, developments of standards and guidelines. And what is the one that we're most interested in right now, at least from our perspective, is the one that's called the Vitamin and Mineral Food Supplements uh, Guideline. Now this was adopted by the CCNFSDU uh, committee in November 2004 over our very strong objections and over the objections of the South African delegation. It was just us two against the world and everyone else you know, wanted them to go through. These are going to uh, reduce the potency on vitamin mineral supplements, reduce the availability of them, what you can even get. And the countries in the EU that are the most liberal, and I'm not telling you anything you probably don't already know, are Britain, Ireland, Sweden, and the Netherlands. So these countries are all to be dumbed down to the level, not nearly quite the level, but almost the level of France and Germany. France and Germany will come up by inches. We will all come down by feet until we meet at a lowest common denominator, and that will be deemed harmonization. Now, it's already operating at a separate level for you guys because <clears throat> you are subject to the EU Food Supplements Directive, which will kick in at the end of this year, fully kick in at the end of the year. It started in 2005, but it's going through the implementation process and it will take effect, and you'll see a lot of things disappear off your health food shop shelves because of it. Well, what they've done at the Codex meeting is uh, that at least certainly the German one, the EU representative, the European Commission representative, an individual by the name of uh, Basil Matthew Dacus, uh, was trying to track the Codex uh, food supplements guidelines to mirror the food supplements directive, and since they really uh, the EU really ran the show there. In fact, several times at the meeting, uh, I would observe the, uh, uh, the Mr. Matthew Dacus actually giving instructions to the chairman. You will do this, you will do that. Yeah, oh, okay, I'll do this. And uh, that's what happened. And then I myself would have these knockdown, drag out fights on the floor because we were rather unconventional and outspoken. We didn't know the rules of you know, dainty parliamentary discussion or whatever that govern these things. So we were uh, using fairly harsh words and 
you know, I wanted to uh, thrash this guy to within an inch of his life, but I forgot my tape measure, so I couldn't do it. Uh, but, uh, but anyway, you'd get some heightened feelings here, and, and uh, this is what a meeting looks like, by the way. You see these, this was taken in Rome at the FAO building in 2007, and this is viewed from our, our position here. And by the way, I don't know if you can see it, but dead center of the picture is a gentleman in a white shirt. Looks like he has a mohawk, and he's standing up. And that's the chairman, Mr. Grossklaus, of the uh, CCNFSDU committee, with whom I've also had equal uh, share of arguments. Um, the most notable last one was where uh, I heard the previous speaker speaking very eloquently about the depletion of vitamins and minerals in our food supply over the last 50 or so years, which I completely agree with, by the way. And I pointed that out to the committee because they're trying to set standards based on a diet that was 50 years old, not the diet we're getting now. And the chairman told me I was an idiot because uh, the food's the same. You know, the crops have the same level. And he said, oh, German studies show that they have the same level. And I said, no, British and American studies show just the opposite. Uh, but um, he had the power to shut, shut this down. Now, the, the discussion down. Now, it's interesting in this room, this is in, near the Colosseum in Rome, this building. And it'll be held this year as well. And we'll go to this meeting. I'll be probably in, in one month from now. No, yeah, one month from now, I'll be sitting in the same room, about the same position. And on the ceiling, they have this very interesting, in fact, Ian would probably get a kick out of it, very interesting mural that shows all sorts of uh, science fiction-y star shapes and spaceship designs and all of that. And there must be some story behind it. I don't know what it is. But at the front of the room are the people who, who um, uh, run the show, you know, the chairman in the center and then the various staff people around. So you have, at these codex meetings, you have the chairman and the codex staff. Now I have to actually take my hat off to the codex staff because they've always been good to us. We've never had a problem with them. Chairman, maybe yes, others not. And then in the beginning, sort of like the, the gold member holders, you know, they get to sit at the front, the national governments, A to B, Albania to Zimbabwe, in that order. And then you have behind them, and these are all bureaucrats, by the way. They claim they represent consumers, but they're just the unelected F FDA type, FSA type functionaries who go there that wouldn't know nutrition if it bit them on the nose. And then you have the INGOs, the international non-governmental organizations. Well, <clears throat> you know, I had first started attending meetings as a member of the US delegation. And in fact, any of you sitting here have the right to attend these meetings as a member of the UK delegation. You just write them, say, you want to be on there. If they approve you, you could sit on there and you could attend the meeting. But at least in the case of the Americans, you have to sign a paper that says, I agree that I will not lobby any other delegation, that I'm just there to support the US delegate, blah, 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 signed under blood, drop of blood, blah. And that's it. And if you don't abide by that, they kick you off. Well, of course, I didn't really abide by it. But so the, after two years of that, uh, the American delegate, at the time Elizabeth Yetley said, oh no, I'm not gonna let you on the next year. So that kind of forced me, I always operate better under pressure, that forced me to get uh, codex accredited status for the National Health Federation. I said, well, I'm going. So they turned me down several times. You have to be persistent, but I got it. And then only later did they realize their mistake in letting us in. But at least in the beginning, you know, they, they thought we were going to be okay. So members of the public can also sit in in the nosebleed section. You can't say anything. But the ones who can, you can just observe, and you can't even take pictures. I'm glad you have a good sense of humor. Um, the national governments can speak out, and they uh, get to speak first. Then we get to speak, the INGOs, and I'm uh, often sp speaking out. I'll give you an example. The most recent Codex meeting, I went to the Cal Calgary Can Canadian one. They host the CCFL, the Codex Committee on Food Labeling meeting. And that is establishing uh, labeling standards, what you can say about food supplements, what you can say about foods in general. The hot topic there, especially this year, and it just happened the beginning of this month, the first week of May, the hot topic was GM food labeling, as it has been for many years. 
because you have basically two camps. You have the, what I call the Western Hemispheric grain exporting countries that don't want to have GM food labeling because they know their grains, which are all GM grown, won't be bought by the consumers in Europe or in the developing world. And then you have the Eastern Hemispheric states, you know, the EU and the others who are fighting to have uh, the GM labeling. In fact, it's kind of funny because my allies, our allies at these meetings are the EU, whereas at the German meeting, they're our enemy just about. So it's kind of funny to have these uh, different sort of shifting alliances. But in any event, at this meeting in Calgary, uh, it started out the usual way on this topic. They'll have several different agenda items. And when we got to this one, this was the hot topic that consumed most of the day. And uh, the Americans and the Canadians, the Mexicans weren't there because of the swine flu thing, so they didn't show up. But the Argentinians, the Australians, the New Zealanders, and then a smattering of some American colonial uh, attendees uh, were speaking out against GM food labeling. Oh, the consumer, the American said, is too ignorant to understand the concept, and it will be misleading and deceptive to the consumer to know that they're eating GM food, so we should not have it. And each year they try to get it taken off the table as a matter to be considered. So the EU spoke up against them, and Brazil actually is on our side as well. They're the exception in the Western Hemisphere. And then came our turn, but all these others are so polite, you know, oh, the respected, you know, delegate from the United States is perhaps mistaken in thinking that this, you know, that kind of language. So then when I get up there, then I go, you know, this is, let's be honest with each other. This is all about business and commerce. They just want to sell their their crappy goods to you know Europe and so I'm speaking kind of like this not quite but but generally and then Health Canada the representative has said oh the free market should decide and I said so we have these Canadian members of our organization they're furious because Health Canada goes in if you try to put GM free on a label they shut you down so they're talking out of the you know wrong side of their mouth to say oh let the free market decide when they're acting you know, aggressively to shut down the free market in this. So how can this even be? So we went back and forth, and I took the floor nine times on this issue uh, at various stages. So I was not very popular with the Americans or the Canadians, certainly, or the others. In fact, I got a few comments afterwards. But it was interesting because there are other INGOs there. Typically, we're the only INGO that represents consumers at a lot of these meetings. But at this meeting, there were uh, some others, an uh, interesting organization called the 49th Parallel uh, Bio Consortium uh, Continuum or something like that. And they spoke up, and he made an important point because the American delegate had been saying, oh, well, GM food had been trying to insert language into the labeling guidelines that G GM foods are no different than normal foods. GM foods are the same. So he, he pointed out, he agreed with our comments, he supported them, and then he said, very important point here. He said, well, why do the companies rush to the patent office to patent them, their special GM food products, if they're the, exactly the same as the others? Why do they do that? She didn't respond to that. But you can see it, gets, it can get very contentious. And then the chairman, who was kind of in the pocket of the Americans and Canadians, and he was Canadian himself since the meeting was held in Canada, he wanted to put it on, on pause for three years took us till after the meeting to figure out that's exactly when the Obama presidency would end and you know he'd be up for re-election so they're probably hoping that you know there'd be another administration but um, because on that issue at least there have been some indications that we can make some headway other issues none at all because there's no change from uh, the Bush administration and most of the position in fact actually the change has been for the worse but Anyway, that's been the, the supposition. But I was able to defeat that along with the Danish delegation and the um, Kenyan delegation. And we all spoke up and, and shut that down. And then um, there were some other things that went on where they tried to take it off the table again entirely. But the end result is it'll be up for consideration next year. We're launching a campaign in Canada and the US to to make the Canadian and American delegates follow the wishes of their citizenry. Because most Can Canadians, most Americans, do not want, uh, do not want this to uh, be suppressed. So, and then last but not least, you have the press that's sometimes there, but not often. Usually it's the 
alternative press. Now, I'm going to stun you by telling you that codex is a noble concept. Um, I say that just to shock you. Because uh, codex actually, the purpose, stated purpose of it is twofold. One is to have healthy, safe food for consumers. And the second is to eliminate barriers, international barriers to trade. Those we can agree with. But what's happened? You know, again, it's a case where you have a captured, in this case, not an agency, but a commission. It's an elitist, top-down driven agenda. You have people wanting to tell us what to do instead of letting the consumers decide. It's very pro-drug, very pro-pharmaceutical, anti-natural foods, anti-supplements, uh, and anti-free market. It's also creakingly slow, as most government action is, to react to changes. You know, with the doubling time in knowledge and what we know increasing uh, geometrically, no, logarithmically, uh, they set these standards, and by the time they get them in place after years of debate and considering them, they're already out of date. So what, what are they doing? They're holding us back, even in, with the best of intentions, they're doing us harm. Again, captured. And it's based upon junk science. This is just junk, junk science, because what they're doing is they're taking the toxicological model of um, drugs and man-made products, and they're applying it to natural natural items. So they come up with these nice words like risk assessment, risk analysis, risk management, but they want to apply the German way of doing it, the German uh, and French somewhat way of doing it. So this toxicological model where, again, going back to this Napoleonic code concept, where it doesn't matter if we've all been consuming this and our ancestors for millennia before us safely, it's got to be proven safe. So you have very expensive products that will come out of things that are, as I pointed out before, inherently safe or extremely safe at the, at the least. But the funny thing is you have, and you would think they would be our allies at this meeting, but you have the trade organizations for, uh, British, uh, uh, for the British uh, health food shops, for the American health food stores and health food manufacturers, and they all think this is great because they don't care about the innovative products, the small and medium-sized companies that produce the real innovative stuff that will help you. They just want the Me Too, Fred Flintstone kind of vitamins that, you know, they kind of keep you going or at least they can make sales. And they'll be able to sell them throughout the world without any barriers. Lots of profit from doing that, but who's it going to help? So they don't mind stepping on these others. So these company, this uh, cartoonist, I don't know if you can see it out there, but these uh, vitamin manufacturers are thinking, oh, science-based safe upper limits, you know. This is, we've operated without safe upper limits on vitamins and minerals for decades, and you can see what the death rate is from that. It's practically zero, and effectively zero, statistically speaking. And yet, they're snatching at the bait of science-based safe upper limits, thinking, oh, this will make us all uh, prove how good we are, and uh, yet it won't. It, it will not. It will be the death knell for the industry, certainly for the innovative part of the industry. So they're creating standards and guidelines based upon junk science, and they think this is terrific. Uh, so a lot of times we are arguing against these outfits like the International Alliance for Dietary Food Supplement Associations, IADSA, which has taken a very pro-codex stand, uh, the Council for Responsible Nutrition. All of these are industry groups. So what do we come up with then? We come up with these kind of issues at the meeting. The vitamin mineral food guidelines that I've already discussed, having the knockdown drag out fights with uh, Mr. Matthew Dacus over that. The GM food labeling, I gave you an example of that. Uh, last year, about uh, 13 months ago, 14 months ago, we went to the um, Codex Committee on Food Additives meeting in uh, Beijing, because China hosts that now. And we argued, we were the only consumer organization there. And you know, when I go to these meetings, sometimes I'm there by myself, other times we have a few other people in our delegation. And I, I know it may sound a little bit corny, but I, I actually think about all of you, not individually, but I think, God, I'm here, you know, I'm speaking for people who can't really who aren't represented, they certainly aren't represented by their countries who are trying to suppress these natural 
remedies and natural supplements. So, you know, it seems like a, a, a big burden, but, um, but it's actually, I, I feel better, even though I'm ignored and, and shunned by a lot of the other delegates it's, it's, who see me as nothing but a troublemaker, it's actually quite satisfactory because there are people like you who I imagine being behind me and I hope realistically imagine. And, uh, you know, it gives me a lot of the energy and drive to, to do what I do there. And so, so it was with the... Uh, thank you. Thank you. So it was with the aspartame, because the aspartame, uh, no one was speaking out against it. You had industry people there who were saying, oh, studies show it's safe, completely safe. And we were the only ones, I was the only one to speak out at the meeting about it. Um, unfortunately, I'm sad to report, it's too far along in the process. It will be approved by Codex as a food additive. But we have more hope with, as you would say, the aluminum food additives, the ones that are used in baking and the like. We, again, we were the only ones to speak out. But the chairman, interestingly enough, supported us. This was a case where the Chinese chairman uh, said, you know, we used to treat this as a contaminant. Now this is like in baking powder and other things. You find a lot of, of this and it's very dangerous. Uh, it can accumulate and, um, and hurt uh, your thinking processes amongst many other processes, bodily processes there. Now I also went to the Rotterdam meeting uh, in March and that's the one on the Codex Committee on Contaminants in Food and it was generally just pretty humdrum until we got to the issue of melamine, which you may recall was the contaminant from the Chinese food manufacturers. They poisoned a lot of pet food products and a lot of pets died, dogs and cats died, and then you started finding it in like infant formulas because it's very, for those of you who don't know, it's a very cheap substitute for protein and you can spike, it's like artificially spiking a food product. So when you test it, the tests aren't sensitive enough to say, oh, this is melamine. Well, they're starting to be now after this problem arose. But before I'd say, oh, protein content, 20%. Ah, that's great. But it wasn't real protein, it was fake protein. It was this melamine that they were throwing in the Chinese manufacturers, but it was killing people, pets and the like. So at this meeting in Rotterdam, I couldn't believe it when I saw, it was the first time we'd gone to this particular committee meeting, but it was so easy because I was based in Paris, so I just got on the high-speed train and I was there. Uh, but they wanted to approve limits, limits, but high limits on melamine. I said there should be no detectable limits on it, none whatsoever. So here I threw a spanner in the works there because they were all set to go on and do it. And in fact, the chairman turned to me at one point and we, we um, are dealing with it in working groups, so that will happen and is happening now uh, with us submitting papers and discussing this uh, with the working group members, which is just a subset of the regular committee, uh, to get no detectable limits on it. So that's what we're arguing for there. But the Canadian delegate, the Dutch delegate, some of the others, they couldn't believe that we were even challenging this. That's how far out of touch with reality they are. So. We have, uh, we have publications that these people put out, these people being the Codex uh, Commission. And this is just an example here. They put out this international, um, this, uh, the one on the left is, they put them out in French, Spanish, and English. The one on the left deals with food labeling. And the one on the right just deals with safer food and is generally one of their, uh, pro-codex pieces, but they do have the codex strategic plan, and it's a, it's a booklet like this that's been updated. It used to say, I think, 2004 to 2007. Now this one's 2008 to 2013. And there are a lot of people who will tell you that codex is not concerned with domestic legislation, but they are wrong. And the proof is in the pudding right here if you just go to this book and you go to the strategic plan. Now, I don't expect you to read that, so I'll read it to you. And it says here, the Codex Alimentarius Commission envisions a world afforded the highest attainable levels of consumer protection, including food safety and quality. That's a noble goal. To this end, the Commission will develop internationally agreed standards and related texts for use in domestic regulation 
and international trade in food that are based on scientific principles and fulfill the objectives of consumer health protection and fair practices in food trade. So in domestic regulation. So if anyone tells you that this is not to apply domestically, and you'll usually hear this from the trade organizations, tell them they're wrong. Again, turn, flip the page on this same book, and it's mentioned here several times. I won't read the first one, but the second one at the bottom says application at the international and national levels. This is what they're, they're aiming for. They want it to be worldwide. And in fact, what we found is some of the third world countries are so eager to implement the codex standards, they're actually implementing them before they're adopted by the commission. They're actually putting them into effect before that time. So here we come to truth number two is the problem that, that we face, I think, is a highly centralized um, world where power is very remote from the people like you and I that sit here. So the second truth that I would propose to you is you need to decentralize government whenever and wherever possible. You need to diffuse the power because power is very, very uh, corrupting as we all have heard the adage. It's very um, uh, dehumanizing actually to us and we need to get, I know it sounds a little uh, quaint, but get power back to the people, the old 60s slogan. The more remote the rulers, the more corrupt and less accountable they are. And there's a tendency among too many people now to look to government to solve all their problems. Just witness the election of Obama in the US. I mean, of course, we had to suffer through the Bush years, so who wouldn't have been relieved? You know, you could have elected Hitler almost and we would have been relieved. <laughs> so uh, when Obama came on, we, you know, breathed uh, a sigh of relief, but you know, he's not God, nor will he ever be, and there will be a lot of disappointed people because of it. You know, government is not God. Uh, in the old days, people looked to the Catholic Church as the, as the main support, and then after the schisms and all of that, then it was their respective churches, Protestant or otherwise. But there's an unfortunate tendency today to think that government is so powerful that it can give you whatever God might give you. And I just want to state the obvious because it's so subsumed within the culture. Oh, this elector, this, uh, I'm sorry, this uh, legislator, this member of parliament, he'll be able to or she'll be able to give you what you want. Well, it's not true. Truth number three, no matter whom you vote for, the government always gets elected. You will always get, and they'll talk a good show, you'll agree with them maybe even on some points, but when, it, when the tire meets the road, it's the same old story, nothing changes. And why is that? Because there are men and women behind the scenes that are pulling their strings. You think Obama's any different than Bush? No, he's standing on the shoulders of Bush and he's controlled by the same people that controlled Bush. Uh, you look at the people around Obama, they're all Jimmy Carter retreads from the 70s. They're no different. And so to expect, even if he had the best of intentions, unless he pulls a JFK and goes independent, he's not someone to, um, to, uh, to, to trust, to do anything that will change, at least for the US. And the same thing applies to any other country. So what can you do about any of this? So politicians don't see the light, they just feel the heat. So you've got to put heat on them. Educate yourself first. Be what I call persistently vocal. That means that you do not just write a letter to your member of parliament or your European member of parliament and then go sit back and watch EastEnders or whatever it is and, and sort socks or whatever you do and think you've accomplished your goal. You haven't. You know, after you've sent that letter, send an email, pick up the phone, call, go down to his or her office and bug them. Then start it all over again, do it again. Write your own letters to the editor. If you see a letter to the editor that's stupid and takes a position that's anti-freedom or anti-health, then write back, write a responsive letter. Um, write your own op-ed piece. A lot of times newspapers are, are very eager to get op-ed pieces uh, in, their, in their local papers. You know, it doesn't have to be the London Times. It could be your local uh, village or city paper. Challenge, challenge, challenge each and every time. And just uh, remember to be persistent. I want to give you an example of, of someone who was very persistent. It was our former president of our organization, Maureen Solomon, <coughs> 
who um, in the late 80s in the United States, there was a move afoot to uh, make it illegal to, um, it was called the United States Post Office Bill, and it was to make it illegal to ship supplements by U.S. mail. And at that time, there were not all these alternatives. Even FedEx was in its you know, relative infancy. And so if they did that, they would effectively shut off commerce in supplements. Uh, so she went to Washington to meet with a proponent of this bill. It was a Democrat by the name of Claude Pepper from Florida, who supposedly represented all these retirees in the south of Florida, and she couldn't get an appointment. He kept shutting her out. So she was not to be taken lightly and not to be refused, and uh, she died, unfortunately, two, three years ago, but she was knee-high to a grasshopper, but boy, was she powerful. And so she booked it, she found out through her charm, she found out when he was flying back to his constitu constituency from Washington, D.C. to Florida, booked a flight, got the seat right next to him in first class, and flew all the way down with him, talking his ear off, all the way to Florida. Well, within two weeks of that, the bill, he withdrew the bill from Congress and it never appeared again. And that's persistence. And that was her, and that's what she did. And very few people know about this, and we didn't talk much about it, but supplements could have been strangled back in the late 80s, but thanks to her, they weren't. Uh, so, yeah, thank you. She deserves a lot of, a, a lot of applause. The, um, the other thing I want to encourage you to do is join with others to act. I would, of course, encourage you to join with NHF. We have just this year started a local uh, branch, local in the sense of national branch here in the UK, and I would encourage you to do that. But I skipped ahead, and I probably shouldn't have. I wanted to use a quote from a person I absolutely despise. So I got Lyndon Johnson, who is probably the most corrupt politician in the world, probably responsible for Kennedy's assassination, at least in part. But he did say something that was brilliant, and that is that what convinces is conviction. When you're writing these letters to the editor, when you're talking to others, you need to have the conviction. Believe in the argument you're advancing. And he says it all here. If you don't, I'll just read it for those of you who can't. If you don't, you're as good as dead. The other person will sense that something isn't there and no chain of reasoning, no matter how logical or elegant or brilliant, will win your case for you. Now, this is a man who made his career conniving in the U.S. Senate and cheating and stealing from others. And so he could know if anyone would know about this. But it's so true, these words are very true. There's nothing like conviction. There's another example uh, of this, which is maybe a little bit better example. It's uh, during the Spanish Civil War, the, when the Franco uh, uprising occurred in 1936, they were close to finishing the war. They didn't quite succeed. They thought it would be a, a, a little a, a palace coup but they were stopped by the popular uprising of the people, but they were not professionals, they were amateurs, and the professional troops, the Moroccan troops and the, the Spanish Foreign Legion troops were beating them back and would have been in, in Madrid by, by November of that year, but for the conviction of some people, London Eastenders, Chicago Southsiders, men who j joined these international brigades and went there to stop them, and they had no military training, they had nothing but their conviction, and they stopped them cold. Unfortunately, that civil war went on for a number of years, but it goes to show that when people have this conviction in their hearts and in their minds, you can stop just about anything. On the flip side of that, you can advance just about anything. So you want to keep this conviction in, in mind. So the NHF is the world's oldest health freedom organization. Next January will be 55 years old. We've been active on many fronts, fluoridation, vaccinations. Uh, we even had the American Medical Association spy on us for uh, two decades at our conventions in the U.S. because we were anti-fluoridation of wa water supply, anti-vaccination, and I think you already know a lot of the arguments there, and unfortunately in Britain today, there's a move afoot to re-fluoridate or to actually fluoridate and I've been talking with some individuals here about that, and we hope to launch some campaigns uh, to stop that. We've been highly successful at stopping a lot of that in the states, 
uh, getting exemptions written into state law for religious and philosophical exemptions for those who don't want to have vaccinations. And we hope to do some of that here as well. We have members in 17 countries and we're the only health freedom organization with a seat at the Codex meetings. We have a lobbyist in Washington, D.C. Uh, we don't pay him $6 million a day because we couldn't afford it, but we do have a lobbyist who works for us. We put out ads and do advertising. Uh, this ad was actually created here in the UK, up in York, uh, for us, and uh, we've, we've used it from time to time. I don't know how visible it is. Uh, we meet with some of the better uh, politicians. This is, for those of you who know Ron Paul, he was a recipient of our Health Freedom Hero Award uh, last year and is a very big proponent of health freedom in the United States and elsewhere. Uh, he ran for president. He got no press because he wasn't controlled by the Bilderbergers or any of those people. So they tried to shut him out every chance they got. Uh, but he should have been the, had it been a truly open political campaign, he would have been the person running against Obama, by the way. But that was not to be made or to happen. This is, you, I don't expect you to read this at all. This is just to give you an idea. This is a letter that we sent to um, Mr. Noel Griffin of the Food Standards Agency in London on their proposed draft definition of advertising in relation to nutrition and health claims. This is an example of what we also do. And we need support because there are only so many of us who can do this. But to try to affect standards both in the UK, in the EU, in the US, in Canada. And then here is my favorite person in the UK. This is Glenda Davis. And she's seated over here. And she is our NHF UK Executive Director. And I encourage all of you to go up and introduce yourself and say hi and say, I'm tired of this nonsense. What can I do to help? And so if you see this lovely woman somewhere around uh, with her jet plane boyfriend, then um, that's her. And uh, yeah, he flies 747s for British Airways, so be careful. Uh, this is the, just an advertisement you'll see in our program. Uh, Glenda, by the way, is actually the one who wrote the article in the program that's attributed to me. Somehow it was attributed to me, but she deserves the credit. Um, so go contact her, please. And just remember that you can have as many cars and houses and lovely things in your life as you want, but um, you know, what really counts is the legacy that you leave afterwards. And uh, that's the important thing. And if it's not going to be us to do all of this, then who's going to do it? And if it's not going to be done now, then when it, will it be done? When it's too late? So I'm quoting Ronald Reagan here, so you may find that a bit funny, but, <laughs> but these are apt words. I debated whether to leave his name off, but I thought you deserved to, need to know where it came from. So I um, strongly encourage you to work with us. I think there's a, about 10 minutes, and uh, so I'm not sure if anyone has any questions that I could answer, because I probably have about 10 minutes before things uh, wind up, if anyone does. And if you don't, it's a little hard. I see some hand over there, yes. How, how in September? December, December. Well, uh, that's actually a good question because some people will have confused the codex regulations with the EU food supplements regulations. And I'm not saying that you have because you clearly haven't. But uh, by the end of this um, year, by December 31, that is at the start of the next year, 2010, any supplements that have not had a dossier that's been approved by the European Food Standards Agency, they are not allowed to be sold unless they have an active dossier that's in process still with a kind of an exemption that's able to be worked on. So they will have to come off the shelves. And actually, uh, Hollins and Barrett and some of these other big chains, they've already started removing a lot of those in preparation. These are the big supporters of CRN and IADSA, by the way, Holland and Barrett and some of these others that are working for the codex guidelines, not against them. And they're all caving into this. So bottom line, there's more to it than just that. But 
I can't give you the details of which supplements, but usually they're high-end potent supplements. That anyone that doesn't have a dossier that's been submitted and approved or not in process, that'll come off the store shelves. So, oh, sorry. Uh, we, I remember the fight here a couple of years back in Europe. Yes. When uh, some agency or some someone they. Uh, removed from the shelves a whole lot of natural remedies mm. like uh, uh, black... Uh, black cohosh? Yes, yeah. good stuff. Yes. But that was not uh, this uh, codex. Well, that was more the EU, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, it was more the EU. And, and they also, they wanted to put a roof on the, the amount of vitamin C that we were supposed to allow to, be, uh, to take. Yes. I don't know who that was, but then we talked uh, that the, our understanding back then was that this is some force that want to make it unhealthy or, or promote the idea this is unhealthy till all the small uh, producers are kind of shut down and then they can introduce their version of the same and suddenly it becomes healthy again. But now the the... They, the big companies then have control. Can you say something about, is, is this true? So it's actually, there's the monopoly companies fighting the, the small ones. I'm glad you raised that point. You know, the funny thing about these talks is afterwards I always think, oh, I should have said that, I should have said that point. So I'm glad you said that. An interesting thing about this capturing of the agencies, it's also happening in the industry. A lot of the pharmaceutical companies are buying up some of the bigger health food companies and capturing them like Pfizer bought uh, capsule gel in the US that makes uh, liquid gel capsules. And uh, I don't remember all the names, but they've been capturing some of the big companies. And then that's one reason the trade uh, associations are against us at the Codex meetings because then you have these pharmaceutical controlled big companies, you know, vitamin companies that are members of the trade association, they're arguing in favor of the pharmaceutical companies. And so then, then that is going on, absolutely. So you have to be somewhat suspicious of the larger companies and what they're doing and the information they're giving out. Usually, I found the most reliable source had been the small and medium companies, and those are usually the innovative ones anyway. But bottom line, getting to what you said, yes, there's when the Dietary Supplement Health and Education Act was passed in the United States in 1994 that took away a lot of the arbitrary powers of the Food and Drug Administration there. You know, they could declare it's a formula to be have food additives and take it off the shelf. It was very arbitrary. They liked you. Oh, you part your hair that way. Good. It's okay. You, no. Okay. Out. So one of the things Deshay did is take away the FDA's arbitrary power. Every day now in the US practically, in the press, in the mainstream media, you hear about how the industry is unregulated. Unregu that is so untrue and so flatly false. Uh, it's not even funny, and yet people accept it as gospel there that the vitamin industry is unregulated. But what they found, and the reason to bring this up, is after the passage of Deshay, there were fewer companies then, vitamin companies, and they thought this was a great thing, but they didn't realize how much innovation uh, would be unleashed by Deshay. You started having a thousand new products coming out each year, innovative formulas, things that people never heard of, higher potencies, uh, new ingredients, new mixtures of ingredients, new research that showed what they could do, all of these things. And then a lot of them took a long, hard look at this and a gulp and they go, gosh, we're getting our, our asses kicked. We need to do something. So now there are a lot of the energy behind Codex and putting the brakes on to eliminate the comp competition. And what you were saying about then afterwards they could come in and pick up the pieces, yes, that's probably true. I haven't, I mean, I've heard Sorry. people speculate. <coughs> yeah, exactly. They could, for change. Yes, in the back. Right, one second, because oh. I'll just come down with the microphone. <laughs> thank you. If you thank do you. have a question, um, if you want to kind of stick your hand up so I can see you. Um, yeah, I see you now. Here you go. Brilliant. Actually, yeah, if you have questions, do you want to come and kind of line up here in the middle? Um, just so I don't have to run around. That's, Ooh. that's, but Richard. I'm sorry I asked. <laughs> oh, right. I was just wondering, like, how come it's, you are the only one um, in those codex meetings and in the whole world, for that matter, who is 
standing up and saying something about this? I mean, is everyone at these codex I'm meetings Satanists or something? Or do they just not care about the world? And also, you know, mm -hmm. on, on a kind of similar note, how do they lobby people exactly? How does that happen, like, in, in Congress and in, in Parliament? Do they literally just pay them money? Or, and, and thirdly, also just slightly, people like Greenpeace. I heard that Codex are about to reintroduce a load of pesticides which have been illegal before. They, I didn't hear the last part. What? Um, I've, I've heard that um, part of Codex's plan is to reintroduce a load of pesticides which have been illegal up until, I don't know, uh, that's part sort of, of the, uh, over 20, 30 years. Yeah, that's, that's true. Um, okay, well, answering your first question first, I'm being punished. That's why I'm the only one. And... Uh, <laughs> But I think after they let us in the door, they realized they'd made a mistake, and some other organizations that have applied for codex status have not been approved. But to be fair, there are some shifting alliances that do happen, and like the South African delegate, Antoinette Boysen was wonderful, and we couldn't have done a lot of things without her. And uh, the Indian delegation at times was good, uh, various other ones. On the GM food labeling issue, we have a lot of support. Even the EU supports us, or we support them, as the case may be. So we aren't always speaking alone, but at least from a consumer standpoint, we certainly are. And then, uh, but it's just because this is the other thing. They're doing this in the dark shadows. You know, it's not done in, in the Parliament here. It's not done in the halls of Congress, even in Washington, D.C. It's being done in distant shores by unelected bureaucratic functionaries, and this is the way they like it. It's all quiet. There's not much press on it. There's not much publicity. That's the other reason we're there, is to shine light on this, and we write about it. It's on our website, which I should give you, by the way, which is if you go to www. Dot <laughs> I've got to wait. Uh, v, T-H-E, NHF, our initials, NHF.com. You can get a lot of this information. You can sign up either at the desk here, we have a booth, or online, and we keep your information strictly confidential. We don't trade or exchange or spam you or anything like that. No one has access to it but three people in our organization. Uh, and you can be on our press releases and the information that comes out. If you had, you would have heard some of even what I said now because for instance, my report on the Codex meeting on GM food labeling, I sent out on, on uh, May, May 7th. So uh, then your second question, your middle question about uh, the lobbying of these people, how does it happen and all of that, I mean, you know, it, it's the age-old game. They exchange money. Look at Bill Clinton when he sold uh, military secrets to the Red Chinese for targeting ICBMs on on. Uh, U.S. Uh, cities, you know, that was cheap. That was like $2 million to the Democratic National Party by way of Indonesia. So you have these middlemen that fund, uh, funnel, uh, you know, the funds in and deposit into the accounts. And he did that over the objection of the Department of Commerce, the Department of State, the Pentagon, the CIA, the FBI, and yet he approved it and it went through. And that's just one example. So they send, they'll send strippers, they'll send money, they'll uh, get blackmail photographs, they'll do what they can, they'll send them on junket trips to Africa, to Europe, to America, to wherever, and uh, the payoff can take many forms. So it's, you know, it's a sad game. And a lot of people say you need campaign reform, and you do, to do this, but you never get at the root problem that way. You can put as many laws in place, oh, you have to report this, and it has to be transparent, blah, blah, blah. They'll always find a way around that to hide it. You think you're ever going to stop that? They can't even stop illegal drugs in prisons. Uh, so how do they expect to stop that? The only way to do it is you stop giving power to the government to dispense favors. The more power they have to dispense favors, the more powerful they are, the more corruption will be because it will attract all the bad elements to this central locus where the party favors are distributed. It's just like putting a pot of gold here and then leaving the room empty and, and advertising it. You know, people are going to come, the worst elements, and steal it. So what you do is you try to take power away from the government. I mean, that's the whole thing, the beauty behind a, at least the original conception of the United States. So you had decentralized power. You know, I was, uh, and I almost forgot to tell this story, but I was in a cafe when I was a student. I went to the Sorbonne as a student study French and Spanish history. 
and uh, went out one evening with uh, some friends, one of whom was a very pretty young girl, and we were at, at a cafe in the heart of uh, the Latin Quarter in Paris, and there was this uh, old French guy, and now I think back at it, he's probably my age. But anyway, <laughs> he, was, he was leering at my friend, so he, in, he invited us over to uh, join him, but he was really just interested in the girl. And he then sneered at me, he said, ah, you're from America, huh? But you're in a country that doesn't even have a name. And I said, what do you mean it doesn't have a name? It's the United States of America. No, that's not a name, that's a description. And, and I, I started to argue with him, but I thought about it, and I thought, you know what? He's right. It isn't a name. He was absolutely right. And why is that? It's because the United States was founded as a decentralized republic. You had Texas, you had Virginia, those are names. You have New York, New Hampshire, New Jersey, uh, Georgia, those are all names. It was meant to be that way. The power was meant to be diffused in the states. The states were to be more powerful even than the federal government. The federal government was just this conceived to be this overarching thing. But the tendency, it's like um, uh, the, the, thermal, the law of thermodynamics, you know, it t entropy increases over time. So power tends to increase and be more and more centralized over time. You have to make a deliberate effort to cut that that trend, and it takes effort and energy and attention, and a lot of us are not, even I, you know, I get distracted with a lot of things. I don't have all this time. So um, you need to take part in as much as you can to reverse this negative entropy here, this positive entropy, and to change, reverse that trend, because it's not going to happen without your efforts. I hope that kind of answered your question. I know I took a side, side route there. Okay, any more questions for Scott, or is that it? Okay, oh, Richard. I'm, I'm very interested in the patenting aspect. Um, it seems that people can take a piece of biology and modify it and then get a patent on it. Uh, that seems to me to be fundamentally wrong. Uh, when, when, did, when were people allowed to start <laughs> patenting biology, and was there not massive resistance to, to people making patents? Um, of that. I mean, should I patent my own DNA in case somebody <laughs> patents it before me? Yeah, well, someone probably has beaten you to it, but, uh, but no, that's an excellent quest a question, and I, I'm not a, a patent lawyer, although I do a lot of intellectual property work, but I did used to work for a patent law firm in Los Angeles for a good number of years, and, and uh, that was never an issue then, but you're absolutely 100% correct. It is an issue now. And how did they get away with, with it? A lot of times patent office is so, um, all it has to be is a novel concept. Um, one of my clients actually is a guy who invented the jet ski. He invented it in 1955 in uh, California, but he thought it was so obvious that he didn't go to the patent office to patent it. He thought, oh, this is so obvious, you just put a motor on it, these kind of things. And he was skiing around, jet skiing around on the Kern River. And then years later, Kawasaki patented it. And he went, damn, I should have done that. And he would have been filthy rich by now. But he didn't do it. Uh, same thing with this. I guess someone, and I don't truly know, so I'm probably not the right person to answer this question. But someone thought, ah, this is a novel concept. And if I just tweak it a little bit, then it'll be different from what's already been out there. And it will be original enough that it'll pass the muster of the US, the British, the Canadian, whatever patent office it might be, and get accepted. And let's just try it. So lo and behold, they did it, and it passed. And then it started establishing a precedent. Now it's an accepted process. So I think it was just sort of someone trying, and uh, it working, and then others jumping on the bandwagon. And now we're here at this problem, because I totally agree with you. It should not be allowed, and yet it is. Yes. We just have time for a couple more okay. questions, and we're going to wrap right. up. So before okay. we make those the last two, okay? Um, the question is, what gives the Americans the right to patent nature? What gives the Americans the right well, to deal American with nature? American food companies like Monsanto, Cargill, those kinds. With, I, can you hold it a little closer? I can't. American hear. food companies like the likes of Monsanto, Cargill, those mm -hmm. kind. What gives them the right to patent nature? Uh, nothing. I, and I would say it applies to any country, whether it's Mexican, Canadian, American, or whatever. It's just Americans are at the forefront of it. But uh, 
but a lot of times they do it with other people's help, all this you know, brain drain to the U.S. To, to do that. But nothing, it's a good point. I think you're making more of a point than really asking a question because yes. I think it answers itself. Yeah, they don't okay. have the right. And the last question. I'd just like to ask you, Scott, of the relevance of the seed bank that they've set up in Northern <laughs> Europe. And, and just sort of your, just your take on, because uh, obviously at the moment I, I've heard of it, but I just wondered what your take on, on this actual seed bank where they're putting the most one natural seeds. The seed. one in Nor Norway, north I of think Trondheim? You, I think you're right. I weren't sure if it was Switzerland, but yeah, no, Norway, I think you're right. Yeah, I think it is it's that. in and Norway. And I just wondered what your take. I think it, it shows that they're really afraid of what could happen if, if things go, <laughs> go wrong, and they want a backup plan just in case. And I think, actually, whoever did that is very wise to have that. And uh, I, I'm glad they did it. I actually support that they did it, but I just don't support the means that require that to, to happen is all. Yeah, it's kind of a, a sad commentary that they're having to do that. So thank you for bringing that up because um, it just highlights the real dangers that even they perceive are, you know, at play here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.